In this video, I'm gonna talk about why witchcraft is political, and I'm also gonna share some information about witches for Palestine, so get yourself a nice hot drink, settle back, relax, and enjoy. Especially in holidays, I kind of like to remind people that Jesus was also Palestinian in a way. Yes. And I always like use it as a way to like just educate people briefly at the fact that the people that were there that were Jewish back in the day of Moses were the same people who became Christians in the time of Jesus, were the same people who also became Muslim later on. They are the same people, although their religions may have varied and although their the languages spoken may have varied, but they are the same people. Yeah. Um, I think when it comes to what's currently happening, it's also the fact that this is an external colonization from people who are not indigenous to the land. And that is something that we can also go into. Yeah. yeah. And there is, a, yeah, there is definitely a continuation of people who have lived on the land. Mm. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Emily. I create content around witchcraft, spirituality, paganism, the occult, and tarot. Really, this is a passion of mine. If you are new to this space, welcome. And if you are joining from another video, thank you again for coming back. So recently you may have seen, I've uploaded some videos that discuss activism. I have been talking about Palestine on my channel and I've been talking about some of the activism that I've been engaging with to call for an immediate ceasefire and to campaign for human rights and for justice and for a free Palestine. So before I get into the video, I want to share with you and uplift the voices of Sabrine and Sami, who are two Palestinian individuals who have partnered with Isha, the activist witch, via the channels of Glitter, C-Y-M-R-U. Isha and their partner conceived Witches for Palestine as a campaign to uplift Palestinian voices, to share information and educate and to raise awareness about what is going on in Palestine and how we can support and how we can help to support one another in this as well. So Isha has organised all of this and a number of creators are taking part and raising awareness for this campaign. Firstly, Isha organised a Q&A with Sami and Sabrin, who very kindly dedicated hours of their time to answering a number of anonymous questions that were submitted. The video went live yesterday on the Glitter CYMRU channel, and it is an incredible watch. I have watched it a number of times already, and I'm still going back to watch it again and again. I have learned so much from watching this, and I highly recommend that you go and watch it and listen to it. And it is a long one, so even if you break it up into chunks, or if you listen to it while you're on the go, I think it's a really, really important thing to do to understand more about the history, more about what's actually happening, about some of the lies that we're told in the media, about how it's complicated, and all of these misconceptions, all of these lies, and things that to a certain extent have been hidden from many of us in the UK and in the USA, for instance, and coming to an understanding, understanding more around actually how our countries are not just complicit but actually responsible for a lot of the pain that has been caused and for a lot of the violence and terrorism as well. So I just want to share that there is in no way that I am going to be able to be as eloquent as I would like to be. You know I felt really nervous preparing to film this video but I just need to get over myself because this is not about me at all and so I really want to centre Sammy and Sabrin in this because their energy, their effort, their knowledge, their wisdom, them, their pure joy and the love that they radiate in that Q&A gave me everything, like so much life and I felt that their hearts are just so genuine and it really was an uplifting experience to listen to. And I'm so, so grateful to them and to Isha for arranging and organising this whole campaign. So I want to highlight that and I'm going to put some clips throughout as well. In addition to the Q&A, the question and answers portion, there is also a GoFundMe page where Witches for Palestine are raising money. All of the funds will be donated to medical aid for Palestinians and you can also be entered into a prize draw to win a number of digital products from creators involved in the campaign. In order to enter all you have to do is donate above five pounds, take a screenshot of your donation and email it to the email address 
in the description box and on screen right now. That way you can be entered into the prize drop and you can win one of the fabulous prizes that are available. So many amazing creators have come together and have offered items. I myself have offered an item for the prize draw and it is a choice of a tarot reading or a distance Reiki healing or a witchcraft consultation with me. It is an incredible cause and if you are able to donate some money towards supporting medical aid for Palestinians, I urge you to go and make your donation over there. I would also urge you to, as I said, watch the full Q&A with Sammy and Sabrin and share it on your channels if you can. Share it with your friends and family via WhatsApp, share it on Facebook, share it on Instagram, share it far and wide as much as you can and get as many people as you can to engage and watch on the Glitter channel and to follow and subscribe as well. The prize draw winners will be announced at the end of the month. There are things happening, there are ways in which you can get involved, so if you wish to pop an email to which is for Palestine, please do. Isha has been fantastic organising this and Sammy and Sabrin have also been so, so kind and generous to offer their expertise, their knowledge, their wisdom and to share so openly and vulnerably around this, which is just so incredibly powerful and I'm incredibly grateful. There are a number of key aspects to the question and answer session that really spoke to me. There were some beautiful questions and Sammy and Sabrin answered so beautifully about the things they love about their homeland, about Palestine, and about the joys of the food and the culture and the music and the way that Palestinians love and care and are raised with a spirit of love and compassion and forgiveness as well. It was a really, as I said, uplifting experience to listen to watch. Like what I know about the land is what I know from growing up to stories and having mm like lived like alongside it and seeing it from afar and having like that kind of kind of connection with it but you have a very deep connection with being actually having been yeah. born there as well uh, and yeah. lived there. I, I probably for me it's kind of a mixed experience as well because mm. despite having you know I was born there and I had spent there quite well you know a few, few a, a good part of my life um but I have also lived a, like away from it and for many years I, I was not allowed back and all of that so there is also this you know leaving the land and the embodiment and the body in the land but there is also a lot of the dreaming of the desire mm. of the stories and the memories of other people mm. but if I have to answer directly one of my favorite thing when I am when I go I go to the West Bank because that's where my family is from and I usually spend my time mostly in Bethlehem, Ramallah and uh, Birzeit and probably for me one of the most connection for me it's the sunset on the hills of Birzeit extremely beautiful the colors and it's such a strong orange and the hills are these rocky hills yeah it's there is something quite moving about it and there are i want to i want to just share that because it's actually something that always it, i find it quite uncanny is that if you go in certain areas in the west bank and look towards the Mediterranean Sea, especially at sunset, you will be able to see the sea. But before you see the sea, you see the skyline of Tel Aviv, like black against the orange of the sunset. And it's quite crazy and quite uncanny thinking that you actually can't get there. Mm -hmm. And that that was built on your ancestral land. Mm -hmm. Kind of jolt you back into reality a little bit because Palestine can be so beautiful. There is this beautiful book by um, Raja Shehade uh, called uh, Palestinian Walks. And he talks about how the walks around Ramallah have, have been changing for the past 50 years. And once again, it's a very uncanny reading. It's beautiful all at the same time. So yes, my favorite part is definitely sunset. I, I think like that reminds me the way you said about like seeing it and not being able to be there. It's kind of for me like it reminds me of like standing on a mountain in Jordan or across the Dead Sea and looking at Palestine mm, and like of it's something that we used to do very often is that we would like go sit on a mountain and where we would have a really good view of Palestine and we could just sit there and stare at it and want to be there but we can't we know that we can't be there mm. and I know like when I was younger I would know of people like because 
when like back then it wasn't so militarized, I want to say. So people could actually swim across the Dead Sea and come back and be mm. like, we reached the other side and now we're back. So that was... Yeah, now it would yeah, be impossible. Now it would be impossible. And yeah. like, I think for me as well, it's like also the stories, the stories that I saw, how they kind of changed people around me, like the way that my grandparents would cultivate their own lands yeah, in memory yeah. of the lands that they grew up in. So like my grandpa would talk so like so passionately about like orange fields and things like yes. that. And um, it's something like say it's an image that I never got to experience myself, but like walking through his farm and seeing how he would grow his trees as well would make me think about how it would have been for him growing up in those orange fields as well. Yeah. That's another aspect about nature in Palestine, I think. It's like, it's not a full enjoyment. When we talk about it, both in literature and academia, we actually call about double dispossession mm -hmm. because not only you have lost the orange tree or you can, for example, there is a law for which you can forage certain natural herbs mm. and there is a beautiful movie about it called the foragers um, that talks about the law that, that stops people, that from, foraging. Stop people yeah. from foraging in the wild mm. so you not only you are dispossessed physically of something but also you are dispossessed from enjoying that thing without having to connect with the symbol of resistance that it became. Mm. I also continue to be educated and Isha recently uploaded a video on their channel, The Activist Witch, about this whole topic as well and again always learning more. I am incredibly grateful for that. So I wanted to talk today about why witchcraft is political and there's no way to get away from this because I have been thinking about it a lot. I've thought about it a lot over the years, you know, but really very much in the last few months as well and also coming up against struggles when trying to share petitions or raise awareness in spaces that were dedicated for spiritual people coming up against challenges where organizations groups would set up restrictions and not allow people to share anything related to human rights or anything raising awareness around any cause or anything like that and I find that to be incredibly difficult to understand and to get my head around and obviously understanding that some people don't want to have to see certain things and for their mental health they do have to protect themselves from that but also as someone who as I've mentioned has a lot of privilege I want to ensure that I am doing all I can to support and to center those voices so Palestinian voices to lift those people up within our community and to just do better myself to learn more and to continue to raise awareness and to continue to send money, to sign petitions, to march, to talk, to keep talking to family and friends about this and not stopping as well. The boycotts are to kind of put a clog in that system. Like if we boycott McDonald's, which is one of their biggest donors, then they have less money to donate to the IOF who then less have less kind of funds to use on weapons. Yeah. Same with most of these companies is that they do enable the what's happening in Gaza right now like we've seen pictures of like restaurants giving IOF soldiers free meals and things like that and that all enables them and it empowers them yeah not um, to speak about <clears throat> companies that literally invest mm -hmm. in the whole in weapons tech systems and mm -hmm. weapon company but the idea of boycotting by the by the way that the best way to learn about it is going to the BDS website mm -hmm. but the reason why the BTS came to be is because of the success of boycotting with South Africa apartheid mm -hmm. like and it's, it was boycotting on all levels right from sports to cultures like cutting off every ties that you have with a country and a government that is committing crimes mm -hmm. against humanity it's essential for the dismantling of those system of apartheid or the mm -hmm. system of oppression or the system of colonization. So boycotting is because you literally have to cut the air out of the fire, right? Mm -hmm. You can't you can't keep putting fuel on the fire. Also like boycotting and protests are one of the many ways, one of the many ways that we as people can come together and say no, we reject this. We yes. refuse what's happening and we don't want it to happen in our names. The protests are like specifically to raise more awareness and to demand that our government does better, like all of our governments do better. But at the same time, it's 
a way of just saying that we reject all of this. It's like at the at a point of just saying that we will not be subscribers to what is happening. We will not take yeah. part in it. That is not in our names. Mm. That literally the process is to highlight that this is not in our <coughs> names. And also boycotting and protesting are probably some of the basic instruments and tools of democracy mm -hmm. that we can fight back with that we can fight back with in a completely legal peaceful way like we live in a deeply capitalist society if m me as a consumer if i don't even have the freedom to choose where to put my money are we, like what are we even talking about there is clearly a system of oppression then mm -hmm. um, and if they stop us from our freedom of boycotting you can, yeah, there, there is something extremely unsettling on governments starting to talk about laws to prevent people from boycotting because mm -hmm. that's our basic rights as consumer, if not as citizens. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah, like well, and one thing that Sammy and Sabrin mentioned so eloquently within the Q&A was how a free Palestine is really not about a two-state nation, it's about having a Palestine where all people can live with equal rights and be peaceful and really that the activism continues for all the other places as well where similar atrocities are occurring. So when I see a free Palestine I do not think that I disagree with most Palestinians when I say that I don't see it being governed the way that the or governed the way that the Palestinian Authority and Hamas govern today if we are to say that they govern at all today, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, there is no two-state solution. Yeah. Whoever is talking about two-state solution is really just throwing dust into our eyes. Mm -hmm. It's almost impossible to have a two-state solution. I'm not, I'm not even going to talk about ideas and dreams and utopias. Mm -hmm. It's just physically impossible. Mm -hmm. First of all, Gaza is almost completely destroyed, so that also make it sort of impossible. Also, going back to the answer to the previous question about how a two-state solution would be a, dis a concession in some way or a betrayal yes. in some way as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah, and also it's physically impossible. Like, if you go to the West Bank, it's, li it's literally like, it's not a geographically connected, consistent entity. Mm -hmm. There is, it's first of all, there is a separation wall that it's, or apartheid wall that it's illegal under international law, uh, that it's literally dividing the land. And even if it's not divided by the walls, it's divided by the illegal settlements, again, illegal under international law. And so to dismantle the whole thing in order, so that the only way to have a two state solution that I do not believe in, but the only way to have a two-state solution will be to, one, rebuild fully Gaza, and two, to dismantle the whole apartheid system in the West Bank, and also destroy all the settlements so that the Palestinians actually can have geographical consistency and connection. And you see how much more destruction and trauma and problems that this will create, even if it has to happen. Mm -hmm. A lot of Palestinians really believe in one state, again, from the river to the sea, mm -hmm. where there is equal rights for all its citizens. Mm -hmm. do, yeah. do, you, do you feel that it's your view as well? It is definitely my um, view. So what I see in it with a free Palestine, like you said, from the river to the sea, I see a land where we all get to live with all of our rights, with all of our equality, and where we get as people, we get to govern. We get to, we get to choose what is best fitting for us as people, not other people kind of telling us what needs to happen. If that yeah. makes sense, I see it the way that my grandparents described it in the past: a multicultural, multi-religion, multi-religious, multi-ethnic space that everyone feels safe in, which is. You know, like the way that it was described to me as a child is that it was a place where people from different ethnicities, from different religions, lived together as neighbors and friends. Mm. And that is how I've always pictured it in my head. I have not pictured it as a place where anyone would be oppressed or anyone's rights would be kind mm. of trampled on. When I say a free Palestine, I mean like I see a free Palestine for all of us who live there.
And that's incredibly powerful because there is so much work to do, but it is definitely having an impact. And that's another thing that I took away that I really resonated with because being at the marches myself and being able to see the impact that some of the signs, images were having on some of the people who were walking by, listening to children, asking their parents, oh, why is this happening? What's this? And, and having the parents looking and I could really see that people were considering, people were concerned, people were probably going to go home and try and learn more about it and that's something similar to what Sammy and Sabrin were echoing within their answer session. Like someone who has been attending protests quite regularly, yeah. I think they're absolutely a beautiful way to show solidarity and of like even self-care in a way because when I was sitting there watching and witnessing, it's so hard to sit there and do nothing. It's so hard to feel like there is nothing in your power that you can do in that moment to make a change. But when you are out there protesting, when you're out there shouting with people who also understand where you're coming from, you feel like you're in a safe space that contains you and your feelings. You can let your feelings out and you're also showing the people of Palestine. You're showing them that we do stand with them. And this also helps. This helps them in many ways to kind of see that they are not alone in the fight. And this is something that we've been told multiple times is that people in Palestine watch our protests. They feel that kind of solidarity that we send in our protests yeah. and they, they know that we are there fighting with them. I think for me, it's like one of those big things where I have started putting my Saturdays specifically aside for the protest because A, it's solidarity, B, it's fighting back, and C, it's a big part of my self-care as well. Yeah, they're, they are amazing place of love mm -hmm. and healing and community healing and community making and meaning making. Mm -hmm. I, yes. Communal absolutely. support, like, yes. in a way that it's like when I see a child grab the microphone and start um, chanting, and they are empowered because there are so many people around them that are following in their chants. That is such an empowering moment for that child as yeah. well. And it's beautiful to see people bringing their families in solidarity, even like the dogs at the protests. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, and that's another thing probably to say. Is like <clears throat> These protests have been depicted as something violent mm. and aggressive. Like I have been to the London ones, to the Cardiff ones, to the Bristol ones. They are love marches. They are like, love yeah, marches. they are love marches. We are giving love to the people of Palestine and to each other in those yes, moments. Hundred yeah. percent. I found that to be incredibly empowering and uplifting during the marches because obviously there's a lot of feelings, but to see how some people are seeing for the first time some of this information and receiving it, you know some change is happening. Yeah. Yeah. And actually on Saturday we were at the march and there was someone holding uh, a picture of one of the kid, uh, of, of the Palestinian child who died of starvation. And there were a group of teenagers that were just, you know, messing about around town. And they were with their bicycles and they came across the march. They stopped because they were curious about what was happening. And I saw one of the guys looking, one of these young teenagers looking at the pictures of the starving kids and literally do that with their hands in front of their mouth and with their eyes big. Now I'm telling you, if the only thing that that march on Saturday achieved was for that teenager to be shocked into something and question it and maybe go home and start looking at it, that was a massive win. Mm -hmm. Also, like, I remember through some of the actions that we've had going back home and on my way home, I would be like hearing people talk about it. And I don't even know if it's positive or negative or in what context they're talking about it, because I'm just passing them by as they are walking past me. But it is making a difference in that it does get people to talk about it more and discuss it more yeah. and understand what where they where their understanding stops and where they need to do more research and more in, in information like. Yeah. building and diving as well so yeah keep going to those protests <laughs> yeah and also keep going for these protests not just for palestine but for any democratic future mm -hmm. because if we stop protesting that means that we're giving up on actually fair and equal and green mm -hmm. post-capitalist -cap world that i really hope is 
And it's important Coming. to also mention we do not only march for Palestine. We march for Palestine and for all the oppressed people. So mm. like in a few weeks, I know that we are going to be uh, marching with marching for Palestine and Sudan as we do. Yes. Like every time we have speakers from different people who are oppressed come and speak yes. in the Palestine protests. It is to basically decolonize and to like get more awareness about the oppression of all of us in the world, not yes. just in Palestine. This is definitely a global movement mm. and it's a movement that wants to bring a different future to the world, mm. not just for Palestinians. A few weeks ago, we also had a queer march, um, a mm. pretty like a feeder march into the Palestine march. And that was a beautiful display of solidarity as well. Yeah, that's incredibly powerful. And I feel that we are now in such a unique position in order to create real lasting change and impact, especially if we come together to make these changes together. I recently did create some posts on Instagram about witchcraft being political because it it was starting to frustrate me coming up against these kind of areas of blockages I guess where some people just did not want to hear about it and they were spiritual or witchy but this was not part of what they wanted from that or this was not part of their agenda you know being an activist having to think about their privilege it's not part of what they want to be involved with and and for me I don't I don't get that because for me embracing and reclaiming the word which it necessitates that need for looking at my own privilege because I need to be responsible. As a witch, I feel that I need to take responsibility for who I am and what I do, what I put out into the world. And so as part of that, being responsible and taking ownership is also looking at who I am, where I come from, what my privilege is, and decolonizing my ancestry to an extent. I know that some of my ancestors were responsible for atrocities. And that is incredibly upsetting. And that is something that I want to make sure never happens again. And that is something that I'm very passionate about ensuring that I am pursuing and actively fighting for while I'm here on this planet. When you look at the history, I mean, obviously you look at some books and the history is taken completely out of context, there's numbers that fly around that aren't correct, etc. But what you're looking at generally, when you look at people who were persecuted historically for being a witch, or for being accused of being a witch, whether or not they were or were not, they were persecuted because they were different, or they were on the edges of society, or however they chose to live was considered to be unacceptable, or they were disabled, or they were from a marginalised community, or a minority community. So many of the people who were accused of being witches were targeted by political and religious authorities of the time, those, as I said, in marginalised communities, women on the edge of society, doulas and wise women who would support with childbirth, etc. Those who worked with herbs and had a kind of herbal, holistic healing abilities, and those with non-conforming beliefs as well. And the ways in which these people were targeted, this was a way to control the masses into doing and behaving how the authorities, how the people in power wanted people to behave. Additionally, witchcraft, because it is seen to be on the edge of what is considered to be normal, culturally acceptable, and on the fringes of society. It also often draws people who have religious trauma and who are seeking acceptance in a group after they've been persecuted or oppressed. So witchcraft does attract those who are also marginalised, such as people of colour, LGBTQI plus people. And it's because witchcraft is unconventional and it defies typical power dynamics and structures of the patriarchy. The patriarchy which is there as as a system in which to create a safer space for white heterosexual cis men, essentially. So witchcraft has been connected with and utilised as a form of resistance for a very, very long time. And to now, from a place of privilege, come and say, no, politics is not a part of my witchcraft, that to me feels unethical and it feels as if you are bypassing a part of what witchcraft inherently is at its core, by nature. This is part of what it means to be a witch. 
to have that responsibility for who you are and how you show up in the world, but also to recognize your responsibility as a result of your privilege. And that is the privilege that I definitely have and that I want to utilize my understanding and awareness of that to do better and to do all I can in my power to support and to uplift voices of marginalized communities. Witchcraft, spirituality, paganism, these topics align, come together almost like a Venn diagram and the ways in which many people actually discuss it talk about earth religions and you know having a connection with nature etc and these things are really really important because it's about social consciousness and it's about environmentalism, it's about ecology, it's about social justice, it's about activism, it's about anti-capitalism, it's about anti-racism, it's about raising up people of minority cultures, it is about that and I think potentially some people are probably gonna come into the comments and say that their witchcraft isn't political and I'm holier than thou or whatever because I'm stating this this is something that I do believe in if that's the case for you all I would ask is that you sort of consider that position and I feel very strongly that witchcraft is political it always has been political and it always will be political because those who were witches although they would not have been called witches or called themselves witches, those who actually did practice were people who were marginalised, unless they were very, very, very wealthy, aristocratic occultists who had money and power already. Or, as the case was in many instances, those who were accused were actually not practising anything. There is, of course, a long history where witchcraft has been utilised for social change, for social justice, to fight against oppression and patriarchy, to fight oppressive forces. In 1940, Gerald Gardner and his coven in the New Forest raised a cone of power to prevent Hitler from invading Britain and by all accounts it worked because Hitler never made it to invade Britain. And that was obviously a very famous example of where this has been utilised and more recently as well there have been many campaigns by social media to hex the patriarchy, to create social change, to uplift marginalised voices and this is absolutely witchcraft in the zeitgeist, this is important witchcraft in the world that is happening, this is so powerful, so potent and so important and if you are one of these people who don't want anything to do with politics because it's boring or it's upsetting or it makes you feel uncomfortable in your very, very comfortable life. I would just urge you to consider the things that are happening in the world right now and if you're comfortable with that, the violence that is happening right now in Palestine and in other places in the world. And I would ask you to consider if you feel comfortable living in a world where these kind of crimes against humanity are accepted and tolerated and funded and supported by the USA and the UK. I mean, what our world has allowed, I've said this before, but what our world has allowed has shocked and horrified me to my core. As I said in my Witches Black Lent video for Wrath, I will never be the same again because I have done so much research since October and learnt so much more. I knew there was conflict but I never understood why and listening to Sammy and Sabrin's answers, you know, it does ring true that a lot of people over here, we don't know what's going on. People just talk about it being complicated and, and how difficult it is and but they don't see it as their problem because it's not on their doorstep. This is our problem and this is the world that we are living in. So if you are comfortable with being a witch and talking the talk and not walking the walk in this way and embracing activism and social change as part of your witchcraft and you're comfortable living your life and accepting the world the way it is, then that's on you, I think. That's all I can say. For me, I don't think there's any way I could ever imagine that witchcraft is not political. Witchcraft is tapped into and utilised as a tool for empowerment and liberation and justice for all because equality is needed very, very much. And we, like I said in my previous video, we live in a world where everyone sort of feels like they're so woke. But really, there's so much more work to do if we are tolerating the kind of horrors and atrocities and violence that is happening right now. The Israeli occupation is illegal. This is absolutely not something that I can tolerate, that I can stand by 
and not do everything I can to fight against. And I will continue to raise awareness and to be active in my communities. I do want to share, there is a book called The Modern Craft. I reviewed this book last year. It is an excellent book for understanding more nuanced topics from practitioners from marginalized and minority cultures. That is diverse across the board. There are a number of books that Sammy and Sabrin recommend in their video and also that Isha recommends in their video as well. I've also found that the book the Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine by Ilan Pap is available to add to your library on Audible for free, included in your membership. So if you do have an Audible membership, then do go over and get that book in your library and start listening to it. These are ways that we can educate ourselves and learn to do better. I would like to add that I am not an expert. I am not someone who claims to be an expert. I am just someone who wants to make a difference, who wants to make a change and to see that change reflected. And, you know, I felt so embraced by other members of our community. I've been so inspired and my heart has been warmed, honestly, by the actions of some of the members of our community. I'm so grateful to Isha for organising this and I'm so grateful to Glitter and I'm so grateful to Sammy and Sabrin for taking the time that they did and sharing their wisdom and knowledge. I would love you all to go over and watch those videos. I would love you to click and to donate if you can. Please see some of my previous videos if you'd like to hear me talk about wrath and how being embodied and expressing that wrath through my body has been incredibly powerful for activism in a self-care way. There is also a tarot spread on my channel for activism and shadow work. So if you are engaging in some of this work and you want a shadow work, spread that is there for you. There is also a free PDF download of that available on my Patreon. Again, it's free, so you don't need to purchase anything. You don't need to be a member. You just need to click over and download that, and then you can work with that. And please also let me know if there's any Thing that anybody needs. I am available on Instagram and I have an email address as well in my about page. You know, you can contact me. Let me know if you need anything. If you are a Palestinian person or you know of Palestinians who need some kind of support, I am in the Devon area. So if you are in Devon, let me know and maybe I can be of some help locally. But if not, then over the internet, I'm available for support requests. So let me know, you know, if you you are being active in your communities if you need any support. I don't have lots of answers, but I can signpost or I can find out, I can do some research. We're in this together. We're fighting this fight. Witchcraft is political and it always will be. There's no getting away from that. And I am not going to stop talking about it just because some people in some groups want to keep those areas free of anything political or free of anything about human rights or about activism to support a free Palestine and to call for an immediate ceasefire. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that this was helpful. You know what to do. Please let me know how you are doing in the comments if you wish to. Let me know, as I said, if you have any questions or contact me directly if there's anything I can do. All my links are below. Take care of yourselves, stay safe, and I look forward to seeing you again in another video. Many, many blessings. Mwah. My children have done something to this and they've pushed all the books back. <sighs> what are you doing?